Okay. So this was the outline of the course. I don't know if you'll be able to cover emerging technologies today, but feel free to ask questions still. This was my aggressive outline, if you remember. So we're going to talk about emerging memory technologies and memories today. By the way, I'm putting uh, the slides and the papers online. So after I present, um, given uh, assuming, assuming the internet here allows me to do, I actually put the slides online. So you can take a look at them. Or you can ask me, and I can give you through USB. Because internet bandwidth seems to be extremely precious here. I guess others have noticed that too. So that's another reason why you need to do computation somewhere else and then <laughs> minimize the bandwidth, right? Memory bandwidth is like the internet bandwidth. You don't want to use it. <laughs> okay. And feel free to contact me anytime. I know many of you have been doing this uh, after lectures, do, uh, or right after lecture or during the breaks, but I'm available anytime here. And you can, I just uh, copied these over here so that you can look at this from the topic too. But these are some of the things that we're going to cover today. And we're going to cover topic three, memory quality of service, which is also an exciting topic, tomorrow and the other day. OK. So emerging memory technologies. Remember the trends? Uh, we've covered three things. And we're going to solve them in a different way right now. Basically, the need for main memory capacity and bandwidth is increasing. But DRAM capacity is hard to scale. Right? We have a problem with DRAM. So I'm going to bash DRAM in this beginning of this lecture. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't improve it. Energy and power is a key system design concern, and DRAM consumes high power due to leakage and refresh. We may try to fix it, but we may not be able to fix it. Right? And DRAM technology scaling is ending, and we've covered that. And its capacity, cost, and energy are hard to scale. But we want a lot of things from an ideal memory system. So all of these trends go against what we want from an ideal memory system. right? This is just a summary of what we want from an ideal memory. We've always wanted a lot from a memory system. Traditionally, you wanted enough capacity, low cost, and high system performance. High bandwidth, low latency. And we're going to look at another aspect of high system performance tomorrow. New, uh, and with, with, uh, with the new uh, trends, we want technology scalability. Right? So far, this has not been a problem. We want energy efficiency. You can argue that it's not new anymore. And we want quality of service support and configurability. And I would argue that emerging resistive memory technologies can help in these areas. They can provide high capacity, higher capacity. They can provide continuous low cost because they have better scalability in terms of scaling the size of the cell. Well, this is the same thing. And they can also provide energy efficiency, although there are issues here. Uh, they can provide energy efficiency because uh, they happen to be non-volatile and they have low uh, leakage power. So we're going to try to take advantage of those uh, in this lecture. Remember, these were the two potential solutions we were looking at, tolerating DRAM or enabling em emerging memory technologies. We're going to look at this part, and we're going to talk about how to combine, how to, uh, combine DRAM with other emerging technologies. So I'm going through this relatively fast because you've seen these slides. Basically, this is what we will talk about. And also this, how do you, how do you uh, place data between the di different technologies? OK. So what is the opportunity these emerging technologies provide? If DRAM is not going to survive, or if we're not going to be able to make it survive, we'll likely need to replace or augment DRAM with a technology that is more scalable and that is at least similarly efficient, high performance, and fault tolerant. And emerging technologies actually have issues in all of these. Or can be architected to, uh, to, to be so. And we're going to focus on how we can architect these things to be at close enough to DRAM in terms of efficiency, performance, and fault tolerance. Uh, some emerging resistive memory technologies appear promising in this regard. Phase change memory, which I will focus on, uh, is promising. Spin torque transfer magnetic memory is pro promising. And memristors may be promising, although I do not know enough about them. Maybe some of you know better than I do, because HP tends to be relatively secretive on this. And maybe there are other technologies as well. The key question is, can we enable them to replace, augment, or surpass DRAM? Uh, let's take a look at some of these technologies. I think the fundamental distinction between these two different types of technologies is charge versus resistance. Uh, DRAM and flash are charge-based memories. You write data into uh, a storage element. It, has to, it happens to be the capacitor in uh, DRAM by capturing some charge. 
And you read data by detecting the voltage. Right? Uh, in resistive memories, the ones that I discussed briefly, you write data by passing some current, dq, dt, and you read data by detecting the resistance of something. It could be the resistance of the material. The problem with charged memory, and this is uh, prevalent in DRAM, flash, SRAM, it's difficult to place charge and control charge. And we've looked at in DRAM, right? In DRAM, you place charge in a capacitor. It's difficult to control it because it leaks. It gets out of that capacitor that you put the charge in. And reliable sensors becomes even more difficult as the storage units uh, of the uh, charge reduces. In flash, you basically trap the charge in this floating gate. We will not talk about that, but flash is, an, again, another charge-based memory which is facing big scaling challenges. What's the difference between these technologies and resistive memory technologies? In phase change memory, you inject current to change the phase of a material. It's not charge-based. You basically change the phase of a material. One phase is high resistance, the other phase is low resistance. And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail. In spin transfer torque MRAM, you inject current to change the polarity of a magnet. And you can basically detect, uh, determine the resistance uh, by that polarity. Or uh, the resistance actually is determined by the polarity of the magnet. In memristors, you actually inject current to change the atomic structure of the material. And resistance is actually determined by the atom distance. So, and you can detect that. The hope is that in all of these technologies, you can have something, some device that can detect uh, the resistance levels. If that doesn't hold, these technologies will not be effective at all. And that's true actually uh, uh, for DRAM also, right? You, in any memory technology, you have a storage unit and a detection unit. You store, char uh, store uh, a value and you have to be able to detect that reliably. In DRAM, the storage unit is the capacitor and the detection unit is the sense amplifier, right? If you couldn't build sense amplifiers, DRAM wouldn't work. Same as here. You can potentially build this phase change material, but you have to be able to detect the resistance. And recently, there have been developments in the uh, reading device, as it's called in some places, uh, that where you can detect the resistance levels. And that's why this has become interesting recently. So let's take a look at phase change memory. This is actually a memory technology that most uh, all of you have used in your lifetime. Maybe you can tell me where. I think I, g I gave you that. <laughs> but basically, Phase change material exists in two states. And this is, all, uh, this is one example is chalcogenite glass. Uh, amorphous states uh, has these characters. It has low optical reflexivity and high electrical resistivity. And crystalline state has high optical reflexivity and low electrical resistivity. Now I say optical. This is actually used in CD-ROMs, right? CD-ROMs consist of phase change material. And you can actually see the uh, phase cha uh, changes in the phase uh, by writing to the CD-ROM. You can see the different tracks, right, in CD-ROM. So CD-ROMs actually use phase change materials, except they use optical media to detect what is that phase. And recently, there have been techniques that, to, that were developed to detect the resistance of this material. So this is what uh, the material looks like. Basically, you have a heater. You heat up the chalcogenite glass to change its state between amorphous and crystalline. And I have abstracted this earlier. You've seen this picture before. But I have abstracted this heater with the storage element. And then you can have an access device. And this access device is very important. You need to be able to detect that resistance. So this is resistive memory. You can basically associate a logical value with these different states. High resistance states can be 0. Low resistance states can be 1. Right. And a phase change memory cell can be switched between states reliably and quickly. And we actually employ this in CD-ROMs, as I said. The key is, can we read it reliably and quickly? And there's been, uh, there's been uh, enough research in this area that it's become interesting to look at it from a storage and memory perspective today. So how does this work? Uh, how do you actually write data? Basically, you need to change the phase by injecting current. And there are two types of current. You can uh, set current and reset current, puts, these, puts the material into two different states. Uh, to set the... Uh, uh, to set the cell, you need to inject sustained current, if you look at this, to heat the cell above uh, the temperature that's needed to crystallize uh, the cell. To reset the cell, you, sell the, you heat the cell a lot by injecting a lot of current for a short time, such that the uh, material melts, and then you quench. That way you can 
uh, uh, you can actually control whether you store a one or a zero. To read the self, you need to detect the face via material resistance. Basically, you need to have an access device. And I'm not an expert in access devices, but there are many people who worked on these access devices and uh, they've made it reliable at this point. So this is just to give you an example. These are slides from IBM, uh, between Rajendran, who actually works on some of these access devices. But basically this is the set state, it's low resistance, and it's the reset state, it's high resistance. And high resistance is usually seen by this mushroom-like structure over here. And if you look at the resistance values there, Far, far apart from each other. It's a, it is a wide resistance range that enables uh, a relatively easy detection. So that's the underlying, uh, uh, underlying device. What is the opportunity at an architectural level? There are, better, uh, there are a bunch of advantages and disadvantages of this technology. First, it scales better than DRAM as well as Flash because it requires current pulses which scale linearly with feature size and you, it requires detection of resistance. Uh, it's expected to scale to 9 nanometers, and it's actually prototyped at 20 nanometers uh, by IBM in 2008. I believe there are prototypes that are much smaller today. Uh, and the expectation has reduced, uh, has reduced the size of the feature size. So actually, I believe this expectation has been updated by ITRS. Uh, ITRS, International Technology Roadmap of Semiconductors, does a roadmap of where the semiconductor industry is going, and it, does the, it, it generates these trends. And this is one of the trends that they've uh, looked at. So they expected phase change memory to be at 9 nanometer node at 2022. Uh, now just to give you a comparison, there is no expected DRAM to be manufactured at 9 nanometer node today. People are concerned we, we may not be able to go below 20 nanometers. Uh, this can be denser than DRAM also because you can actually store multiple bits per cell. You have a large resistance range, you can chop up that resistance range and de detect where you are in that resistance range. That enables a storage of multiple bits per cell. And there have been prototypes with two bits per cell and four bits, you can imagine, you, you can guess that this is an old slide, four bits per cell by 2012. And I believe that has happened actually, there have been prototypes of that. It's non-volatile. It can retain data for more than 10 years at 85 degrees Celsius. And this is a big advantage because you don't need to refresh it. Well, and it's also have low leakage power. Uh, so we were interested in this technology. This was, I, I think, 2008, because their DRAM was facing a lot of issues, even at that time, right? So when we started looking at this, we surveyed prototypes that were published in circuits and device conferences of this technology. And we tried to derive some parameters for this technology such that we can evaluate at the architectural level. What happens if you replace DRAM with this technology? Or what happens if we augment DRAM with this technology? And I'd encourage you to, uh, if you're looking at an emerging technology, I'd encourage you to look at conferences like this. Uh, IEDM is a good one, for example, inter uh, International Electronic Devices Meeting. They look at these new technologies and tr they try to provide their characteristics. Uh, now we, would like, we wanted to drive the parameters, like latency, energy, bandwidth parameters for phase change memory for a feature size of 90 nanometers. This is high, but we wanted to equalize everything. This turns out to be a tough, tough thing to do, actually. If you look at these conferences, there is no consensus. Everybody has a prototype of their own device, including companies, and there's no consensus on anything. In the end, you end up with a chart like this. And this is a chart from our paper. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but if you look at this, this these are the parameters. For example, uh, read time, read current, read voltage, read power, read energy set time, set current, dot, dot, dot. And these are the papers that discuss between 2003 and 2008 of these different parameters. And you see a lot of blanks. Some papers do not even discuss some of these parameters, right? So if you're doing research to figure out how an emerging technology will impact architecture, this is a practical challenge that you will face. You will see these new technologies that are introduced, but you won't have enough information about them. So we did our best to actually come up with a set of parameters that just make sense within some range. And th these were the parameters that, I, uh, that we came up with at the time. So let me give you the high level. What are these parameters? What are these, uh, what, uh, what are these parameters like and what are they expected to be going forward? So latency of phase change memory is actually comparable to but slower than DRAM. If you look at the latencies of different technologies that we use in our systems today, L1 cache or SRAM, their latencies are on the order of two cycles or so. 
Last of all, the ICs are embedded DRAM, and their latencies are tens of cycles. DRAM is over here. I put two to the nine over there, 500 cycles or so. PCM is, well, within 2x to 4x of DRAM, which is much faster than flash. So if you look at the storage system, flash is on the order of 2 to the 17 cycles with a 4 gigahertz processor, and hard drive is impossible to reach. Right? You would like to actually get rid of hard drives probably. Right? <laughs> And that's the goal, actually, going, for, uh, going forward into the future. Now, that will never happen, because the cost of this will probably uh, be uh, so low. But who, who remembers the tapes? Anybody uses tapes? OK. <laughs> and people actually still use tapes, right, if you would like to uh, do storage. I don't know if everybody uses tapes right now, but who uses tapes? I guess that's what I should ask next. OK, nobody uses tapes. Hard drives may become that way also with these technologies at some point. But anyway. Uh, so read latency of this is uh, what, what we will use is 4x, 4 times DRAM. So it's not fast. Uh, but it's much faster than NAND flash. It's about uh, 1,000 times faster than NAND flash. Its write latency is much worse. It's 12 times DRAM. Its write bandwidth is, again, less than DRAM. And this is actually constrained by the current that you inject. You need to actually heat this material to melt it. And that current is very high. And that's one of the potential impediments for this technology to become mainstream. It requires a lot of heating. But right then, this is similar to flash. Dynamic energy, so I, uh, I put these in red. Red is bad, actually, compared to DRAM. So you see a lot of reds here. That's, uh, it, that, the, the, this means that you need, we need to work on it to enable this technology. So dynamic energy, for a read, it's two times DRAM. For a write, it's 43 times DRAM. It's similar to flash. It's endurance. Although there's an endurance problem. And this exists in Flash. I briefly talked about it. Basically, what happens is if you keep right, uh, if, you, if you do a write into the cell, this induces phase change at a very high temperature. And contacts degrade from thermal expansion and contraction at that high temperature. As a result, you, have, you can do only a limited number of writes per cell. And this number varies depending on who you talk with. But 10 to the 8 writes per cell seems to be a common uh, number. Now, people project that this is going to be much better going forward, 10 to the 12 writes per cell. If you think about DRAM, DRAM doesn't have this problem. As far as we know, DRAM doesn't have an endurance problem. You can do, uh, at least its endurance is 10 to the, uh, greater than 10 to the 15 writes per cell. But uh, for phase change memory, we have this problem. If you look at flash, today you have 10 to the 3 to 10 to the, uh, actually, 10 to the 3, like 3,000 writes per cell, which is much worse than this case. So this will be a problem if you would like to use this as a main memory technology, right? Because main memory, you can do a write very fast from a processor all the way to memory on the order of, I don't know, uh, one microsecond, right? Because this is a slow memory technology also. The advantage, the positive side is the cell size. So cell size is actually much uh, uh, will scale with feature size. And people have prototyped these cells to be much more scalable. So when we looked at the technologies, it's one and a half times DRAM. So it's still larger than DRAM and larger than NAND. But this will continue to scale. That's why I put it as green. And that's the hope. This can enable much larger capacities than uh, what we can achieve with DRAM. So let's, let's summarize the pros and cons. The pros of this technology over DRAM is better technology scaling. As a result, you get better capacity and hopefully better energy as well at some point. It's non-volatile. It has low idle power. doesn't require refresh, low leakage. Cons, many cons. Higher latencies, especially write. Higher active energy, especially write, like 50 times of DRAM. Uh, lower endurance. A cell dies after some number of writes. So there are challenges in enabling phase change memory as a DRAM replacement or helper then. We'd like to mitigate these shortcomings. We'd like to find the right way to place phase change memory in the system. And we'd like to ensure secure and fault tolerant operation of phase change memory. And these are very interesting resource topics going forward. Now one thing uh, I, want, I want to mention is phase change memory is actually superior to flash as a storage technology. So you can actually use this as, uh, in your system uh, as part of your storage subsystem. And People, have actually, people are actually using it in some of the cell phones that you have today. Uh, that's also interesting, but that's less interesting and less aggressive than using this as a main memory technology. Can you actually replace DRAM or use it as part of your main memory than storage? 
Okay, so what are the research challenges in this area? Where do you place phase change memory in the memory hierarchy? Assuming that you don't want to use it as storage, or you assuming that you're already using it as storage also. Uh, do you want to have an OS-controlled phase change memory and DRAM together? Do you want to have hardware-controlled DRAM and OS-controlled phase change memory? And we're going to talk about this. Do you want to have pure phase change memory, phase main memory? Get rid of DRAM entirely. And we're going to explore that limit. How do you mitigate the shortcomings of phase change memory? How do you minimize the amount of DRAM in the system? Assuming DRAM is not going to scale very well, you'd like to do this. And how do you take advantage of some of these different characteristics, like non-volatility? And this non-volatility comes, uh, it's also byte addressable, and it's fast, much faster than flash. If you look at flash today, uh, you don't normally get a single byte out of it. You have to read it as a block device, just like a hard disk. Right? Uh, but whereas phase change memory is so fast, and also, you could actually address every single bit in it. So can you take advantage of, the, of, of a non-volatile uh, storage technology that's so close to DRAM? And I think this is very interesting because this potentially enables having storage at the access latencies of main memory and blurs the distinction between working storage and actually persistent storage. So maybe you can do something better with an existing system. Traditionally, I'm digressing a little bit, but traditionally, we have two very different interfaces to access the working storage and uh, persistent storage. Working storage is load store, right? Main memory, you do loads and stores. And you actually write data structures that operate, that are operated using loads and stores. Whereas persistent storage, there are no data structures that you use, right? What do you use if you write a program in C? Files, right? You have to go through the I.O. subsystem, very different interface. And there's a lot of overhead in that system because you have to go through that file interface. But if everything is so close, and if you have non-volatile memory technology that's very similar to what we have in DRAM today, maybe we should rethink the interface that we have. Maybe we can access everything with load stores, but perhaps we can do something about it such that we can, dis uh, we can designate the requirements of different data, persistent requirements of different data. That gets rid of a lot of the overhead and file system management. But I'm not going to talk about that today. But that's, a, that's another opportunity that's enabled by these technologies. And then finally, can we design specific techniques that are agnostic of the technology that we have. Because phase change memory may be one technology, but it may not be successful, right? It could be spin transfer torque MRAM. Actually, that's looking maybe even more promising according to some people today. Uh, can you design techniques that are agnostic of that? And I think if you come up with a very good interface to access memory and storage together, that will be agnostic of the underlying technology. Okay. So how should phase change memory-based main memory be organized? Today, what we have is DRAM. And maybe going into the future, we'll have some hybrid memory technology. And this is a cartoon. You may have different memory controllers for these. You probably should. And maybe even more aggressively, you can replace the entire DRAM with phase change memory. When we first started out, I guess we were, uh, well, uh, some people have looked at this hybrid memory system, and we'll come back to that. Uh, then the key question is, how do you actually allocate data between DRAM and phase change memory? And we've been looking at this option also. But let's actually look at the extreme option, which is uh, how do you actually, uh, uh, what happens if you, uh, if you replace DRAM with phase change memory? I'm going to skip this one. You can look at it uh, on your own time. Uh, so when we first started out, we wanted to be aggressive. We want to see what are the limits of this technology? If we take DRAM out from the system and replace it with phase change memory, what would you get? And the, the, and the news is not good news, by the way. <laughs> but basically, uh, the key question that you need to address in this case is how do you redesign the entire hierarchy to overcome the shortcomings of phase change memory? I'm going to skip this one also, but this is a primer for st spin transfer torque MRAM. So let's take a look at it. Basically, we've surveyed these prototypes from uh, 2003 and 2008. We have some average phase change memory parameters. And these are the parameters I will use in the next few results. The latency of phase change memory is four times that of DRAM for reads, 12 times that of DRAM for writes. Endurance is uh, a cell dies after 10 to the 8 writes. Energy is two times uh, that of DRAM for dynamic reads, and 43 times that of DRAM for writes. And density will not come into play because we're not going to assu we're assuming that everything is of the same capacity. So what are the results? If you replace DRAM with phase change memory in a four core, four megabyte L2 cache system, and if you organize phase change memory the same way as DRAM, the same peripheral circuitry, same row buffers, same bank, same peripherals, this is what you get. 
Basically, the performance degrades by 60%, the energy degrades by 120%, and you get a memory that dies after 500 hours on average because you keep writing to it, right? And a cell dies after 10 to the 8 writes. And you can do the calculation. It depends on how much write intensity you have. You can kill a lot of your memory cells or memory rows. So this is bad, right? You don't want a memory that dies like that. So we wanted to solve this problem. And actually, this is, there are some applications that, uh, where, uh, that kill the memory even earlier. So we wanted to solve this problem. The problem is, uh, in phase change memory, when you do an array access, you, uh, array uh, access, it's slow. And when you do an array write, it's even slower. And when you do an array write, it actually kills the cell, right? Slowly. But it does kill the cell eventually. So what you would like to do is, perhaps we would like to reorganize what this phase change memory looks like. And it doesn't really need to be organized just uh, like DRAM, right? Why? First of all, uh, in DRAM, you have these large sense amplifiers. And you need these large sense amplifiers because you read an entire row, and that row is destroyed, and you need to drive it back. Whereas in phase change memory, your sense amplifiers do not need to be that large. When you read an entire row, that read is not destructive. Right? You don't need to drive everything back. So you can actually cache in sense amplifiers only a small portion of it. Basically, you can sense only a small portion of what you read. You can still have large rows, but sense only a small portion because the reads are not destructive. Uh, and that's what we had proposed, basically having smaller row buffers, but many of them, basically. Be changing the circuitry such that it's uh, smaller, but having many row buffers. That's the first idea. What does this give you? This reduces the array reads and writes if you have locality. This leads to better endurance, latency, and energy. And the second idea was to, whenever you're doing a write into a phase change memory, you don't do a write. You don't always write the data back into uh, the array. Just like in DRAM, you do that today, right? Whereas in phase change memory, you don't need to do that. If you have not changed a bit, you don't need to write that bit back. That saves endurance. And that's the idea. Basically, you write into the array at cache block or word granularity. This reduces unnecessary wear. And people actually uh, employ these techniques in PCM chips today. They have narrower row buffers than DRAM, and they have sophisticated circuitry to determine what to write back into DRAM, uh, into, into phase change memory. So if you do these two changes to a simple tweaks, I will call them, you can actually get much better results. Uh, your perf the performance degradation over DRAM-based system is 20%. Energy is on par with DRAM because we save significant refresh power and idle power, and you get much better average lifetime, 5.6 years instead of 500 hours. That's a relaxation, right? Uh, and hopefully, scaling improves energy, endurance, and density. Right? As you scale this cell, it becomes better. Now, of course, there are caveats. Uh, I still don't believe this is a viable solution today, and it's not clear if it'll be a viable solution going forward, because worst case, lifetime is much, much shorter. If you look at this, there are some applications that die less than in less uh, that uh, kill the memory even less than a year. So you need you need some guarantees, some basic guarantees from your main memory system, I think, and that guarantee is not provided yet. And this is other people have looked at this problem, and if you're interested, I'd be happy to give you references. But I do not think we are there yet uh, in providing that guarantee. The second uh, in this work, perhaps we didn't have enough uh, these intensive applications see large performance and energy hits. And actually, intensive meaning memory intensive. If you're accessing phase change memory a lot, you see a lot higher uh, hits in terms of delay and energy. And perhaps we use optimistic phase change memory parameters, right? With a different application set and with different parameters, the result may be much worse. So that prompted us to actually look at systems that look more like this. Instead of trying to get rid of DRAM completely from the system, why don't we integrate phase change memory such that it works nicely together with the DRAM. Basically, in this case, somehow we need to design the hardware and software to manage data allocation and movement to achieve the best of multiple technologies. And that's the idea of hybrid memory systems. One option in this system is to use DRAM uh, as a cache for phase change memory. There are actually many options, right? You could actually expose this to the operating system. But we've been looking at using DRAM as a hardware managed cache to phase change memory. And there are reasons for this. Uh, the reason, uh, this, this enables reduced latency on a DRAM cache hit, and it also ensures that the writes 
stay in DRAM before going to phase change memory. Right? So writes do not go into phase change memory directly. Uh, and writes have a problem because you, it has a lot of energy, a lot of latency, and they degrade the, uh, the cells in phase change memory. If you have DRAM, that's hardware managed cache, staged in front of phase change memory, you eliminate a lot of those issues. Now you can say, why not have the operating system manage this DRAM? The problem in that case is the latencies, right? The latencies that you have between DRAM and uh, phase change memory are very, very close and very, very, uh, uh, very, very close to each other. Right? If you want to have operating system overhead to move a block from phase change memory to DRAM, you're actually uh, reducing the, uh, not, not taking advantage of the fast main memory that you have. Uh, and basically, if you have the memory controller hardware managed, the DRAM cache just eliminates the system software overhead. This is actually what people are finding in flash memory systems today. If you actually access flash memory by getting rid of a lot of the software stack uh, operations that are normally done, you can get a much better flash-based system today. I'm going to finish after this slide and we're going to continue. But there are three key issues that we need to tackle to design a system like this, uh, where you have DRAM as a cache for phase change memory. First, what data should be placed in DRAM versus kept in phase change memory? Well, this is very important because the latencies are, even though they're close, they're still very different. And we'd like to overcome the shortcomings of phase change memory. Second, what is the granularity of data movements? If you move data at the granularity of large pages between phase change memory and DRAM, that could be very inefficient, right? Because you're wasting a lot of memory bandwidth on both sides. And that could be high latency as well. And you may not need all of that data. And this is actually another reason why you, don't, you may not want to manage this at the software level. Because software level, to amortize the cost of the software, you want to move data at the large granularity. But that is bad if you're actually doing it through the memory bus. Because memory bus bandwidth is very precious. So what is the granularity of data movement and how do you determine it? And third, if DRAM is a cache that's hardware managed, how do you actually design a low-cost hardware-managed DRAM cache? Because if you have, let's say, one gigabyte of DRAM, that's a lot of data to manage in hardware. And normally, we don't build caches that large. Our caches are much, much smaller than that. And if it's a hardware cache, you need tag stores, right? That those tags need to be managed somewhere. That metadata needs to be managed somewhere. And a large cache comes with a large tag store. So how do you design that tag store efficiently is an interesting issue. So I'll talk about two idea direction at the beginning of the next lecture. One is locality-aware data placement by taking advantage of the robo buffers in each technology. And the second is cheap tax stores and determining the granularity dynamically. I'll briefly cover this. But I do not believe these are the silver bullets that actually solve all the problems that I've discussed over here and earlier. So there's a lot of research that needs to be done to enable a hybrid memory system like this. So if you're interested, I'd be happy to talk beyond these ideas that I will discuss. Any questions? No questions? OK, I'll see you during the break then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what is the advantage of uh, PCM? 